This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today, we're joined by my new friend, Dr. Jonathan Wilson, who is an amazing, amazing guy, and he is running a really, really cool school and has got a great story. And I know, I know you guys are going to love this episode, so please stay tuned and enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater, joined by a new friend out of the great state of Tennessee, John Wilson, who is the head of school of the Edison School in Madison, Tennessee. He's got a very unique school that's doing some amazing things. And when I talked to him, I was like, I got to have this guy on. I got to hear his story and hear what they're doing there in Tennessee. So I don't want to take any thunder away from him. I will pass it off to him to introduce himself. So John, welcome to the podcast, sir. Well, thank you, Mitchell. It's good to be here and a pleasure to join you. And I've enjoyed listening to all the other podcasts that you've put out there and just excited to be a part of this and share a little bit about Edison and what we're doing in the Middle Tennessee area. Love it. Love it. Well, I appreciate you listening in and learning from the other guests that we've had on. So you're going to know that this first question that comes right out of the gate is if I ever visited Madison, Tennessee, what are we going to do for fun there? What's going to be the thing like, Mitchell, you got to do this thing when you come to Madison, Tennessee. Well, we are about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes north of Nashville. And there's a strip in Nashville called Broadway, and you've got to go down Broadway. If you can do it on a Friday or Saturday night, it'll be on foot because there are tens of thousands of people. There's, you know, honky tonks everywhere and uh, live music. All the big name artists have a bar and grill and, you know, all kinds of stuff right there. That's fun. We've got the Nashville Predators uh, hockey team. And they have been really good to follow lately. Titans. Uh, if I'm if I'm not a Dallas Cowboy fan, then I'm a Tennessee Titan fan, just because of where I am. But my favorite sports event would be the Nashville Sounds. You know, they are a baseball team. I love minor league baseball, and uh, you know, got to throw in there. I'm a soccer coach, soccer fan. So we got Nashville Soccer Club as well, which is uh, playing in the Major League Soccer, and just music everywhere. You know, you want to do music. It will take you out and you can see all kinds of music. And uh, you know, we've got some great state parks and other things that my family and I like to hike and walk around as well. So, but there's a lot to do. If you're a foodie, there's all kinds of foods. You got to try Nashville hot chicken. There's no okay. doubt about that. So okay. is that fried or grilled? Well, you it? can get it. You can get it any way you want, mostly fried. There's a couple of places that do some grilled, but the fried hot chicken and there's all kinds of levels. So man and i i'm a foodie for sure like well when i say foodie obviously i love i love food i need it i have to eat it, you know but when i am traveling to new places i like to experience the place through the food or through the drinks of like when i say drinks not even alcoholic just like coffee i usually like to have the local coffee the, when i go to a place that's new i like to not go to the chains and i say what would what should, what should i get and i literally would if they say it and it, i mean typically i'll try anything but obviously i'm paying for it so i'm like I'll try anything that they suggest is the best. So if I went to there, I'm going to try the chicken and try whatever yeah. they suggest. Is barbecue also a big thing in Tennessee? Barbecue is a big thing here too. So, but I smoke my own stuff, so I can't get it as good as I make, at least in my opinion, you know. That's fair. <laughs> so maybe, maybe come and I'll smoke your brisket. So, Bro, I love smoking. I just smoked one. It's actually been a while now since I smoked it. But I made it for, I was at, uh, so as I don't know when this episode will actually air, but it was for Father's Day that I was smoking my last uh, brisket. Smoked it for 18 hours. And when I was at church that morning, the pastor joked with his wife saying like, Do you, did you make me a brisket or something for Father's Day? She's like, no. And I was like, I told him afterwards, I was like, I'm going to bring you some brisket later today. And so I had him, I brought the whole thing. I let him cut it and all that stuff. And, and he, he's from Texas. So I had a lot to live up to. And he said he <laughs> one of the best barbecues he ever had. So I was pretty honored. And so I love me some brisket. That's awesome. It's good That's stuff. Awesome. 
Well, I'd love to get a little bit of background on you, John, before we dive into Edison. So give me a little background on how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, my first job in education, I would say going way back, back into the late eighties was as a janitor at the Christian school that I graduated from and kind of really built my passion for what Christian schools were doing and had some good mentors in the high school that I went to. And, you know, I started out as a physical education teacher at a Christian school in Florida for years and then moved from there. To, I thought I wanted to be a, a full-time college soccer coach. Tried that for a year. And, you know, I was ready to go back to work with kids who are acting their own age, uh, if you will. And so went back to the Christian school I had left as a PE teacher. And I was now the elementary principal and stayed there for about nine years. During that time, my wife and I adopted a little boy who was born on July the 5th of 2002. He was a micro, so he was born between 23 and 24 weeks gestation, little tiny guy. And, you know, he, we fell in love with him the first time we saw him. And there's a whole story to things that happened with him. And as he continued to grow, I realized that to the Christian school I was at, he would never be able to attend unless I changed a lot of people's hearts and minds about kids with special needs. And when we moved here in 09, um, into the Tennessee area, it was for my dad's health and other things. And he ended up passing away. I ran a soccer store for a while and then got tired of fighting Amazon and other online sites decided it was time to go back to education. And in 2018, I heard about the opening at Edison and knew it was, you know, exactly what I wanted. It's not a Christian school but it is a private independent school working with students with special needs. And um, as my wife says, I was uniquely created for this position. And so I've been doing it now. I'm in my fifth year and absolutely loving it. And every day is a new challenge and something different. And I just enjoy loving and learning about our kids. So. I love it. I love your story. And I love that. I think it'll help piece together the next part when we talk about at the Edison school itself, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about your son. Cause I know you and I talked about that last week and kind of just given the audience and the listeners just a peek into what your life has been like the last you know, 20 years now with your son and when you guys adopted him and then obviously your love for coming into Edison and how Edison has, had helped him as well. Okay. Yeah. He, like I said, he was born July the 5th of 2002. And at the time we were living in Fort Myers, Florida area. And in fact, on July the 5th, that night, my wife and I were at a Fort Myers miracle single A baseball game with her brother and his family. And at one point he looks over at me and just asks, you ever wonder where your child is? You know, cause he knew, they knew we were going through an adoption. And I said, yeah, I mean, it, you know, all the time we're wondering it. We found out later that was the same day that our son Caleb was born. Mm. And on July the 10th, we found out about him. So five days later, we found out about him because we had no idea. At the time, we thought we were going through an international adoption. And um, turns out this little micro preemie was born and needed a home. And so my wife and I immediately started praying for him. And then we met him for the first time on July the 15th. And my wife described him as a wrinkled up GI Joe doll, if you can remember those old toys. And so throughout his life, you know, he's always struggled with the way school runs. And so we ended up homeschooling him most of his career just because it was better suited to him. You know, he could do five minutes of math and then five minutes of English and then five minutes of science and then go back to math. And, you know, in, in a traditional school setting, you can't do that. You, you're in a class and you move from class to class. And so he really has changed the way he learns. He's changed my whole philosophy on education and how it should be individualized for the kids. And you figure out what they do well and teach them with that, you know, and you can teach math and science with Legos and Minecraft and games and whatever else is out there, piano, music, and he loves music. So figuring things based on the kids has been the biggest thing I've learned from him. And it's what I bring into Edison and have brought into him since I started was, you know, we got to rethink education. We got to think about it from the kid's perspective mm -hmm. and try to understand what it is they want from us. So. Love that. Love that. So uh, let's dive into then Edison now. So obviously you kind of already shared about 
the, how you got to Edison and what they serve, but maybe a little bit of backstory on just Edison as a school and how long they've been around and how they got to where they are specifically today. Sure. Well, we are actually in our 10th year this year, so it's a big milestone for us and we're going to be celebrating that throughout the year so in 2012 the school was started for the son of my business manager actually he was attending another private school and they needed a better placement for him and so her husband brother-in-law father-in-law the head of school at that school and a few other people got together and created the edison school got it up and running in a few months had a different head of school at that time and started with seven students and worked their way up to mid twenties. And then my immediate predecessor left in fall of 2017. And so they had an interim and there's a lot of questions and not sure the direction they wanted to go. And I met the interim head of school and several board members and just started sharing my vision of what the school could be. And they hired me with zero students enrolled that summer. Nobody had planned on coming back. And we ended up starting the fall of 2018 with seven students again. Wow. That summer I met, gosh, I bought a lot of coffee. I love coffee, <laughs> but I bought coffee for former parents and doctors and therapists and former teachers, just learning what had happened, trying to assess the situation and figure out um, what needed to be done to really change the perception of our school in the community. And so immediately started making all of those changes. And now, you know, we're at 35 currently with students on a waiting list, just because we're trying to get enough faculty to cover everything. So it's exciting and getting the right people on board is fun. So. That's where we're at right now. Love it. Love it. Well, obviously kind of hinted at some of these already, but I'd love to just dive into some of the challenges that you guys are currently up against and not just, you know, what was us here are the challenges, but also like, Hey, these are the challenges, but this is how we're trying to combat these challenges right now and what we're doing to fight those. Right. Well, I, our biggest challenge probably is our space. We currently rent from a church and in the 10 years that we've been around, we're in, I think we're in our fourth different church. So there was, it was great that the school started, but there is really no vision with, you know, are we going to get our own space? Are we going to build? Are we going to buy land? What are we going to do? And so it was jumping from church to church and where we are now, we work with a great church, but space is limited you know, and what we can do is limited because it's, it's just the time from 7.30 till 3.30 in the afternoon. We do have an aftercare program, but anything that we want to do at night, we have to get special permission. If we want to do things on the weekends, we got to get special permission. And so that's a lengthy process. And right. um, so to combat that, we are looking for you know, we're looking for our own space and it, it's going to take us some time. I found a dream building that I would love to be able to buy, but that's going to take a lot of money. And so trying to get people on board with that would be, would, would be fun just to be able to give us our own space. Next would be faculty because we do things so differently and we individualize as much as we possibly can, especially in math and ELA, you know, part of what we ask our teachers to do is develop an individual learning plan for every kid where they figure out where their current level is on all things, math, ELA, social, emotional, you name it. We're going through and figuring all of that out. Mm -hmm. And then while our classes are small, no more than eight to 10 students with usually two adults in there, we're asking our teachers to basically have eight to 10 preps because per subject, because the kids are all over the place. You know, I mean, we may have a 10 year old student who should be in fourth or fifth grade doing seventh or eighth grade math, but English is at a first or second grade level. So getting faculty who see the benefit of helping students exactly where they are is one of our biggest struggles as well, I would say. So those are probably the two really big ones that stand out for me, you know, and we provide a lot of training to our teachers. We are not set in one method or one curriculum. We use a lot of homeschool curricula for our students because it's designed for multi-grade, multi-level students. And our classes are like that. You know, we have five to seven-year-old classroom, 
eight to 11 year olds, 12 to 14 and 15 and older. So not only are they doing a bunch of different subjects, they're also dealing with a bunch of different ages. So it's a lot, it's a lot to juggle. It's a lot oh, yeah. to navigate. And I'd love for you guys to be able to have your own building. Cause I know that's hard to navigate. Like you just said, like, oh, we can't do stuff at night unless we get written permission and all that stuff. Obviously I know you guys love to have that as soon as possible, but is that, it was like, do you guys kind of have a roadmap currently that you guys are working in to try and go, man, with two years, we'd like to be in a spot or something. Well, long-term really five years is the max and, and we're working back from that. So again, you know, I found a space. If I had the money right now, I'd cut the check for it and would be in there next week, but uh, it's going to take us a little bit of time. So hopefully within maybe two years, we can have the, the money to buy, you know, to put down on that one or some other one that's close to it and uh, be able to start working on getting it the way we want it set up. So is there funding from the state of Tennessee available to you guys being a public school? Uh, public school or wait, sorry, you guys are private. That's right. But the yeah. thing that you guys can tap into, I guess that would help you with building that out. Or is there something like they're available for you grants or anything? There are a bunch of grants that we look at and that we apply for at times. You know, we've done, we've done some reading ones through dollar general and they, you know, we get some curriculum from that, but finding some for the capital campaigns like that, I haven't found anything in the state of Tennessee, but I keep looking all the time. Our families get to take advantage of something called the Tennessee Yacht Individualized Education Account, and that helps with tuition. You know, most of our funds come from tuition, and so they can get anywhere from seven to $8,000 to use towards private school tuition from the state. So that helps them, which ultimately helps us because it allows us to, you know, to grow a little more effectively too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Obviously talking with the challenges first, I'd love to dive into what's going really good. Give you a chance to brag about Edison and what you guys are doing. So maybe anybody who's listening can be like, oh, I'm going to take that back to my school. I never thought about doing that. So what are some awesome things going for you guys? Well, our number one thing that we do really well is we do truly individualize our math and ELA for every kid. I mean, our teachers do a phenomenal job of that. They figure out what learning style our kids are, whether they do well, auditory, visually, kinesthetically, and they teach them according to that. They use curriculum that fits them there. And like I said a minute ago, you know, some of them are far advanced in one subject and really low in another. And so we spend a lot of time in those areas where they're really low and we push them in the areas that they're really strong. So individualizing is one of the biggest things that, that our teachers do phenomenally. Um, Second thing is our mentoring program. Our counselor last year, our school counselor came in first year as a school counselor and she implemented a student mentoring program where each one of our students is assigned a faculty member who checks in with them on a regular basis. This year, we're gonna be implementing Friday lunch with the mentor and mentees and where, so my mentees, I'm going to have four of them and we're all going to eat lunch together every Friday just to hang out, check in with each other and see how everybody's doing. And that connection really builds the relationship and lets the kids know that, man, this school's different. They care about me. They love me. They want to see me succeed. And so that's what we're trying to do is build those relationships with them. And then the third thing that I think just really makes my life a whole lot easier is my admin team. My admin team and the faculty, we've got people who uh, it's taken some time, but we've got people who truly believe in our vision of individualizing school for every kid and helping them reach their potential. And so they call me on mistakes that I make. They help me grow and get better. And, and then they push each other and we push the kids. And so the whole team that we have, man, they're just, it's probably the best team I've ever had as an administrator. And so I would take them anywhere. So. Wow. That's awesome. Awesome. It helps to make it work a lot more fun when you got an awesome staff to come beside you every day. It sure does. It sure does. So That's good. Well, where do you kind of see yourself in the school here in the next, I know you mentioned you know, like five years, we want to be in our own spot, but the future of Edison kind of, where do you see it? Or you want to do 20 more years there at Edison? Like what do you see as like kind of the future going forward? Wow. I would love to do another 20 years and, you know, being in my early fifties, I'm not sure if I can do that. These kids keep challenging me to races and all kinds of other stuff. And, uh, my body gets a little bit old with some of that, but 
You know, I would love to see us with our own space where we are able to meet the needs of an array of learning differences and really help the families understand they're valued and they're loved and they're cared about. You know, most of our kids, whether they come to us with a diagnosis or not, most of them have some, suffered some traumatic experience in a school. And some of the stories I've heard from kids just telling each other, not even sharing with me, just overhearing it breaks my heart. And it makes me realize how we as adults and educators need to be aware of what we say and how we talk to everybody. A lot of times, and I've seen this with my own son, a lot of times people will talk about him with him there, but not to him. And, you know, that's the same type of thing that I'm hearing from kids at our school is they're talked about the negative with them sitting there as if they don't understand or they're not listening or they're not paying attention. And so that just, you know, we're trying to change all of that. We're trying to teach these kids that they have value, that they have a lot to bring to the world. And um, so, you know, vision wise, I'd love to change. I'd love to change the mindset of a lot of our kids, every one of them, you know, where they don't start a question with or the answer to a question with, I know this is probably wrong or mm -hmm. I'm stupid, but you know, just trying to get them to believe in themselves. And so in 20 years, I'd love to have several classes that have graduated that are saying, I have value. I, I can change the world. I can do something for good. So. I love that. Is there, do most schools in your area and maybe not the whole state of Tennessee, but just at least specifically your area all have special ed programs and classes. Do all of them have that? All the public schools do. Yes. Is it something that I'm just trying to like, I'm, I have the ideas running through my head. Is it ever something where you see Edison going, okay, let's two options here. We're going to try and make ourselves a public school or a public charter school and have all these like say, Hey state, we want to have all those students in one school that knows exactly how to work with them and the classes and individualized learning plans and all that. And then you have all the funding from the state that helps you guys grow tremendously because you're going to take the special ed programs kind of away from the other ones. Or do you just try to do that, but as the private model and you go forward and you go, Hey, like you go to these families, like, Hey, we have the solution for you and your families. Is this my, again, my idea in my head, is that ever something you guys would ever look at doing or thought of before? It's not something we've thought of, but now that you throw it out there, it's not a bad idea. We work well with the school systems in our area. And so they know about us and, you know, I try to maintain that relationship with them as well, just because there's going to be times they come across kids that no matter what they try, they're not reaching them. And so sometimes a, a different setting is the best option for yeah. those kids. And that's what we provide. So again, we don't require a diagnosis for our kids, but you know, we try anybody. So. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Well, as we look to wrap up the episode, I always end with one of my favorite questions, which is passing it off to the guests to share any piece of advice or encouragement or anything that they would have for any of the school leaders listening. So what would you tell them if you had something to be able to say to them? Well, that's a good question. You know, one of the things that I would want everybody in education to know is to be aware of any limiting communication that you use. You know, as I go back to some of the stories of the kids that we have over and over, every one of them has been told, you can't do this. You will never do that. You can't write. You're not going to be able to do math. So don't bother. So let's just make you happy and move you on. And that limiting language, really, the more they hear that, the more they believe it and the harder it is to change their mentality and get them to see that. Yes, you can. You're struggling with this right now. And that's okay. That's what we're here for is to help you get past your struggles. That would be the first thing I would say. And then for leaders, make sure you are taking time to mentor your other leaders and your faculty, you know, teach the next generation of leaders. Cause we're only going to be in this position for a while. You asked about 20 years. I mean, I, I would love to do it for 20 years. But I'm always looking at who's going to be the next person, who's going to be that person that can step up and move into this role. And if they're better than me, then I move on, 
you know, it's just the way it is. And so take time to train them and really help them become the leader that they need to be as an admin and as faculty. So. So good. It makes your life easier too. It yeah. does. It does. <laughs> so it's a double, double way of me. It's really in a good way. It's a good thing to do. So that's right. That's right. I love it. John, man, thank you so much for giving up your time today to hop on this podcast. I love that you were passionate about students. You can tell by your smile and just by the way you, you are conducting yourself on this episode, you love what you're doing. You love these students. So just a big shout out to you. And I wish you nothing but the best as you guys continue to, to love these kids, educate these kids and, and hopefully more and more years, maybe 20 more years of educating those students there in Tennessee, man. So just thank you so much for your time today. Well, my pleasure. And Mitchell, thank you. Thank you again for what you're doing. I love the program. I love the podcasts and all that you're doing to help educators around the country and the world really become better and connect with each other. So thanks for that. Thanks, John. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Dr. Jonathan for taking time and being on the podcast today. I love what he's doing at the Edison School and I'm wishing them nothing but the best as they continue to grow and educate the next generation that's coming behind us. And if you're a school that's listening today and you're struggling to fill seats or find ways to grow your school or connect better with your families or get more leads, any of that stuff, we'd love to hear from you. You can check us out online on our website, schoolsuccessmakers.com. That's schoolsuccessmakers.com. Or if you're a Facebook user, check out our private Facebook group just for school leaders called School Success Makers. That's School Success Makers on Facebook, private group just for school leaders. I'm personally in there and I would love to also see you in there as well. We'll be here next time with another amazing guest as usual on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then.